Welcome to the Movement Upgraded Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Jen Hostler, licensed physical therapist and certified strength and mobility coach. Here you can expect to hear about all things movement. The Movement Upgraded Podcast is a blend of the science of strength training, rehab, and mobility mixed with the personal and professional experience to provide you with the steps you need to keep your body pain-free and moving well so you can do what you love forever. Welcome back to the Movement Upgraded podcast. This is a special podcast where I'm going to give a little recap of our trip and um, tell you a couple stories and use those to help solidify some of a lot of what's wrong with our understandings of mobility work, of pain, rehab, and also to give you just a little bit of a reminder as to why we do the things that we do, like cars every day. And I know personally that sometimes when you do something that's really repetitive and boring like cars, you're like, am I really doing anything? Yeah, in the moment they feel good, right? Like they feel good. You're like, I checked it off. Like I feel a little bit better. I feel amazing, but there's going to be a point in time when you're just like plateauing because they're not giving you the ROI. You're not getting that immediate return on, yeah, I feel better. It's just like, yeah, okay. Um, And maybe sometimes you'll take a break from them, maybe not do them as often. And then you'll be like, oh, never mind. I did feel a lot better. I just didn't realize it. Right. Um, And the reason that I wanted to bring this up is because most of the benefits from these tedious, boring things like cars are not in the things we experience, but in the things we avoid. And that means that it's the stuff that could happen in the future and we're mitigating it. And that word mitigate is something I use a lot um, because it's the better word to, to describe what we do with mobility training and strength training when it comes to injuries because we can't prevent them, right? We've talked about that on the podcast. Injuries are gonna happen. You're gonna experience pain. It's part of the human experience. But what we can do with all of the things we talk about with managing all of those big dials of stress and sleep and nutrition, and then also training specifically to prepare our tissues for things we're going to do. A lot of what that's doing is mitigating our risk for injuries and chronic diseases, like all of the things, a couple of the things that I'm going to talk about today. And when we are mitigating those things, we are making sure that they occur less likely, which means there are potential times when you would have gotten injured doing something but you didn't because of the training that you had done you don't know when those things are you will never know right so i think sometimes we get we we lose sight of what we're doing and and forget how much or don't even know how much we are actually avoiding and we start to focus on i'm not making progress or am i really doing anything so keep that in mind um the other part of injury mitigation is less um less likely no when we do have an injury, we are going to have less severe injuries, right? So again, you don't know. Sometimes I tell my clients that often, um, maybe you sprained your ankle, but imagine how much more or how much worse it could have been if you weren't doing training, right? You don't know. And those are all speculation, but I like to use that as a little reminder, like, Hey, maybe my injury, I'm sorry, maybe my mobility training hasn't gone the best. I don't feel like I'm making as much progress, but like, you know, I did just have a flare up the other day and it wasn't as bad. And the third part of injury mitigation is that your flare ups or your injuries don't last as long or you get, you recover faster. And again, you would never know. So you don't know what it could have been. You don't know if, if you recovered from a flare up in three days, if it could have been three weeks, because you never know, you won't ever know. Right. But that is what I want you to keep in mind. And sometimes we get really caught up in comparing ourselves to all the people on social media and all of these things. And when I go back into um, Indiana and visit family who are not doing a lot of these things, I'm very often reminded of the path that we can choose for ourselves that decades pass and we don't attend to our joints and we try to do something and all of a sudden we're out of commission for weeks. Mm -hmm. And those are things that I like to keep in mind and they just are a little bit of a boost of like motivation and drive, right? So if you're in the middle of like a, I'm just kind of feeling not like stagnant about things or I just don't feel like I've I've done enough, right? We kind of get into those head spaces. This is going to be an episode for you. So um, that's kind of why I wanted to bring these things up because um, 
I think that that's really important to just have like these little reminders and motivational or inspirational type of things, um, whatever woo woo you want to think it is. I think it is kind of helpful a lot of times. So let's chat about our trip. So I am both Ryan and I were born and raised in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And so a couple times a year, we make the drive 17 hours to go all the way up there and visit our families because in the Midwest, you don't leave the Midwest. So almost everybody in our families are still in the Midwest. And both of our parents now live on lakes, which are on the outskirts of Fort Wayne. So they're like 45 minutes or so away. And so they're about an hour from each other. And so we are really lucky that we can go back and forth when we're visiting. And so we get to kind of see everybody all at once, which is awesome. Um, and um, it's it's a great visit. And Fort Wayne specifically is really beautiful about three to four months of the year. And those months are in the summer. And Florida and Tampa where we live now it's miserable in those months right because it's just so hot and miserable you have to be in a body of water if you want to be outside so we usually try to take obviously we go back for um we do go back for Christmas um and we go see our family then but we try to take I think we started this a few years ago about a week or so off of work to drive up there a 17 hour trek and hang out in the summer on the lake because it's just really beautiful there and really fun so my little brother graduated from high school this past week. I turned 30 the week before that. And so I was like, why not just go up there and celebrate both of those weekends in, together? So that's what we did. While we are up there, um, well, first, whenever we're on vacation, if we are with other people, we almost it's almost like we're not on vacation. Um, it's very, very different. So I'm not complaining. It's just funny how it works because everybody has these nagging issues or flare ups and um, very often we have stuff that we can do to help them. Now uh, we've done this for a while and we've kind of worked with so many of our family members. We have good boundaries. So we don't just, people can't just ask me for free advice on a regular basis. And if you're a coach or a clinician who knows a lot about mobility and you get this, you, you totally understand. You're like nodding your head right now. Um, you can't just give everybody free information all day long. But when it comes to our close families, we usually try to help them out a little bit because they often will help us out in the areas that we don't know, like cars or something like that. And so when we're up there, um, very often somebody has something go on. Now, we, like I was saying, we've done this long enough that they know, well, if you haven't been doing your cars, that's where you start. And we'll go through those with them or we'll just tell them to do them. And most of the time, again, the cars kind of clear it up and it's fine. Now, this past time when we were up visiting, there were two things that happened, two stories that I'm going to tell you. The first story was Ryan's dad actually had a very big flare up, like a very big injury to his shoulder that was being beyond just do your cars, he could not lift his shoulder very well. So this kind of required a little bit more attention. So a little background on his dad, he was a firefighter. So he had fitness as part of his like repertoire. He had to do physical fitness to, to keep his job. Um, and so they did do a lot of cardio, a little bit of strength training here and there. Um, but he's been retired for like five years, I wanna say, maybe four. And so he hasn't been doing as much of the strength training and they have never done mobility training. So he's gone decades of his life without really doing any joint specific training. As we get older, our tissues become less pliable and less healthy and more stiff and weak. That is just a natural progression of things if we are not doing anything to address them. Simply, simply, simply doing cars on a daily basis will help to mitigate this. Not 100%, but quite a substantial amount to keep your tissues pliable, to keep your range of motion, um, and to maintain a baseline level of strength. Now, there's not going to be a ton of strength maintained there, but the pliability and the range of motion will be there. That's really, really important because then all we need to do beyond that is a little bit of mobility training to mean to, to get back what we've lost and then a little bit of strength training. Um, but most of us have not been doing that and Ryan's dad's definitely one of them. He hurt his finger, he like smashed it um, and was out of commission for several weeks with his, I wanna say hobbies, but he has kind of like a side, side gig and um, 
he works on boats and does a lot of different things. And this, this specifically, he, uh, this particular instance when we were coming up, he was working on a boat. So he was out of commission on that boat for several weeks. Um, so he wasn't moving a lot because of his finger. That healed and he went to work on the boat and worked on it all day long went to bed and woke up in excruciating pain. Now, our logical brains, when are so zoomed in, we're in pain, we just assume that the, the pain we're experiencing is the direct, only the one thing that's right in front of us. So he's like, I slept wrong. And if you've been around for a while, if you're anything like me, or you've been listening to things, you know that that's not always the case. And we need to have a zoomed out perspective and look at our workload. So look at the loads going through our bodies, looking at what was his shoulder doing the day before and what was his shoulder doing the several weeks to months before. If all of a sudden we start to try to ask our shoulder to do something when we have not prepared that shoulder to do said thing for weeks or months, then we are probably at a high risk for injuries and pain. And by probably, I mean we definitely are. The older we get, the more this is important, right? Because we've not been addressing these things and so usually we have less healthy tissues, so we are more at risk for an injury and an acute workload increase, which just means all of a sudden I went from not really doing much with my shoulder to now I'm doing overhead work and cranking it into weird positions or lifting a bunch all of a sudden out of nowhere or a lot, a high number of repetitive movements. So you could have a high number of repetitive movements or you can have a low number of heavy movements. Those are accumulative and they're very similar on our bodies, not the same, but similar. Anytime we have that, when we haven't prepared our body and worked into it slowly, or we've had a bout of like doing absolutely nothing for several weeks or months, that's where we are at a higher risk for having an injury. So looking back, we now see, okay, well, he's had decades of not addressing his shoulder. We know his shoulder mobility isn't the best because he wasn't educated, didn't know these things, and he's had several shoulder like nagging things before. Um, And so now he has this big injury and this is beyond just telling him to do cars because those actually were flaring him up. So this is one of the very few times we didn't do cars. And I started him with some very basic isometric um, exercises that he was able to progress in about a week. And we knew he was progressing because he was sleeping better. He got to sleep in a bed finally. He was on less medication. So those are ways that we kind of progress the rehab process. But I wanted to bring this up to remind you that sometimes we think that cars are, we're not really doing much, right? This goes back to what I was saying in the beginning. We feel like we're not doing much. How is this really helping? It doesn't feel like a ton, but I promise you, it's not about how much you're doing right up front. It's about the accumulation over decades of just little inputs reminding your body, hey, I want to maintain this mobility. It's literally can be that simple. Um, That way months and years don't go by and all of a sudden you're like, I can't reach my arm up my back very well, or I can't, or I try to go do something and now I have a huge, uh, like a, a, a big, um, a big spike in pain or an acute injury like his dad had, for example. And just the perfect example of that. The second thing I want you to get out of this is to remember that we can't expect our bodies to work and function well when we haven't done things to prepare them. It's unfair for us to expect our bodies to tolerate something. Um, Like if we decide we're gonna get into training, right? So let's pretend we haven't been lifting for maybe a few weeks, maybe several months, just it's been wonky on and off. And we're like, all right, I'm getting back to it. And the first day you get back, you're like, I'm gonna test my one rep max, or I'm gonna get into a heavy set of five by five. I just want you to realize that's a significant increase in load for your back. and. Um, your hips and your knees and ankles. And it's unfair of, of us to expect them to be able to tolerate that really well, especially if you are older and haven't been addressing these things. So we really have to, this is what we mean by load management. It's really just paying attention to, oh, I haven't lifted in several weeks or several months. Let's pull back and let me start at a lower intensity, a lower weight, and let me kind of work my way back up. I like to tell people to start a little more conservatively. Um, If you're in the gym, 
consistently and have been somebody who lifts pretty heavy, uh, maybe you don't have to be as conservative, but if you're somebody who tends to be injured a lot, you're working through an injury or pain, or you are somebody who's older and maybe hasn't been doing a lot of this stuff, definitely err more on the conservative side, right? Like, um, and this is not just like lifting, right? This goes back to Ryan's dad's example. He wasn't lifting, but he was doing work on a boat where he's doing a lot of shoulder movements that are repetitive. So repetitive movements also apply. It's all movements, life, like fitness in the gym is one way that we load our bodies, but life has its own loads too, which is why we do cars and, and things like pay attention to our joints because it's not just about squatting. It's about getting our shoulder overhead and being able to tolerate that. So those are the things that I wanted to, to touch on with that. The second story I wanted to bring up was an older relative of mine, um, that kind of cornered me at my brother's graduation party. He is a great uncle of mine. So he was my mom's uncle and um, he's fascinating to talk to. I always enjoy our conversations. But recently he was talking to me about physical therapy and he's like, I really thought about you. I had, you know, several visits uh, for physical therapy for my shoulder. I had a shoulder injury and he was telling me about that and then um, gave me very long details about it, which is what typically happens. And um, then he was like, well, the reason I wanted to bring this up is because I've had this low back pain for a very long time. What do you know about spondylosis? And I think that's the term. There's a, a few variations of spondylosis, like spondylolysis, spondylolisthesis. I'm pretty sure it was spondylosis. Um, but he was asking me what my thoughts are on that. And if I'd heard of it, I'm like, of course I've heard of it. That's part of, you know, what we have to learn. Like, what about it? And he's like, well, I was diagnosed with that. And I've always had these back issues, but I'm wondering if physical therapy will help me with, with you know, with this. Can it, can it help with that? And I was like, well... Here's the thing, if you are having pain in your back and you have an image done, what you find on an image does not always correlate with the pain. So I cannot tell you that the pain you're experiencing is because of your spondylosis and I cannot tell you that you need to get rid of spondylosis to feel better. Very often, we cannot do much about degenerative changes that have already happened. So maybe you already have some spondylosis, some, some we would call that maybe like quote unquote wear and tear, um, in the back, that's totally fine. You can have that. Most people have wear and tear as we get older, um, but it doesn't always need to be painful. The pain is different and we can definitely address pain and make your back feel a lot better in physical therapy. So he was explaining to me that he had been shown that this all started actually, which is, I love everybody's stories about how we think about our pain and how it starts. And he was explaining to me that his back pain started when he joined I want to say it wasn't the pain. He said, I knew I had back issues. My back issues started when I was trying to join the Marines. And um, the, somebody looked at his back and said, you're going to have back issues. Your back is curved wrong. Um, and he tried to say it was straight or something or wasn't straight. I don't know. It wasn't scoliosis that he was explaining to me because we clarified that. But, you know, this person who was looking at him before he could go into the Marines was like, we'll take you anyways, but you're going to have back issues. So I'm going to pause right here. And you already know how I feel about this type of language. Internally, I was like screaming and headbutting a wall. Like that's actually physically how I feel. Um, some may say it's a little bit of a trigger for me, <laughs> but I was like, no, why do we do these things, right? You know that is how I feel if you've been around because what we say has a direct impact, right? So now he's got this understanding of I have a problematic back, so he's probably going to move it less. He's not going to move it very much. He's not going to load it, and he's just going to think it's bad all the time, which all of those things are correlated to low back pain, right? So eventually he does develop low back pain. Um, he says he's been shown some exercises that feel really good, which he showed to me one of them, which is just laying on your side and doing what they call like a book opener. And they call this thoracic rotation. Most people that I see do this are just moving through one segment in their mid backs. Um, and while it does feel great and feels really good, um, it's not really what we, it's not really going to be enough. It can feel good in the moment and that's great, but um, you know, it's just, it's not enough to actually tackle the thing that he needs. And there was zero intentional controlling movement of your spine, which is mind boggling to me because in, intentional movement is very helpful. And if we're not intentional, we're just moving through what we already moved through, but that's besides the point. So I told him, yes, go to your doctor, get a um, 
I didn't even say that. I said, yes, go get physical therapy. This is the second point I wanted to bring up and why I'm telling you this long story. Um, the reason that I wanted to bring this up is because I told him to go get physical therapy and he said, okay, so I'm going to ask my doctor for a script next time I'm in there. And I said, you know what? You can totally do that. Tell your doctor that you would like a script for physical therapy, but I will also tell you that one, if your doctor does not give you a script, that you should still go because you can. And number two, you can go to physical therapy without a script. Um, This is a very old school way of thinking only because um, physical therapists didn't always have what we call direct access, which means you couldn't always just walk into a physical therapist office. Uh, I do believe we have it now, finally, um, in every state, and some states are different than others, but you should always be able to walk into a physical therapy office and say, hey, I want to I work with you. Some of the offices are so old school, they will tell you, uh, you need to go back and get a script. Some of that is because of insurance, so I will say that happens, but a lot of them are just scared. Um, I worked in an office that... I worked in a clinic that very much did not perpetuate this. They were not good at it, um, which is really frustrating because if we want our profession to be taken seriously a little bit more, we need to be the biggest advocates for it. And um, it just seemed very, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not counterintuitive. I'll think of it. But it just, it was very not consistent with the words that the clinic would say, right? Like they're really we need to advocate for physical therapy, but then it's like the daily things that you do were not consistent with that. So a lot of clinics are that way. um, And if you find one that's like that, honestly, you probably wanna find a different clinic anyways, but you should be able to go in and get a direct access to your physical therapy clinic. Even if your doctor says, no, you don't need it, or I don't don't recommend that, I would very much caution you to be an advocate for yourself um, because this is kind of like my second point to this second point, which, If you're following along, kudos to you. Um, But the old school way of thinking is that doctors, like medical doctors or primary care physicians, are very much the gatekeepers to the rest of healthcare. So very often we would just take what the doctor says as like Bible, right? And the the physician, the primary care would be the director to all of the other places that they need to go. Um, But they're supposed to know everything. We trust their word for everything. But most primary care physicians know a little about a lot of things. They don't know very much about anything specifically. And that's how they need to be. That's how they operate best, right? So I just want to remind you that they don't always know. They're not always up to date on the standards of practice and what we recommend for things like musculoskeletal injuries. A lot of them don't read current research. A lot of them are just stuck in their old ways. Um, A lot of them don't necessarily respect physical therapists. There's a lot of reasons that it happens and a lot of them are not their fault. So please don't get mad and like let loose on your doctor. The system's kind of broken um, in a lot of ways. So just remember they're human. Everybody's human. Doctors are not perfect. Uh, But just know that if they are not recommending it or they're not refusing or they're refusing to write you a script, you can go into your um, your, uh, physical therapist that you get along with and uh, work with them. And I actually think one of the best things that most people could do is have a physical therapist kind of like you have a primary care physician or you have your go-to for maybe like an eye doctor or your dermatologist or your OBGYN that you develop a relationship with because you're gonna have pain and injuries and nagging things that pop up. And um, I think it can be so, so helpful if you can just go directly to that person. They already know you, they know your story, they know your body, um, they know your history. And developing that relationship can be super helpful. And it's definitely something that I think a lot of people I talk to are really grateful for um, the way that we practice. Not that I know everything in my practice is perfect, but I think they're really grateful for, hey, this popped up. Can we work on this and address this? And I think for many people that can be super like life-saving and just like really stress reducing um, because we have a lot of fear around pain and things like that. And sometimes if we can just ask somebody and be like, oh, I can do something about this or, oh, it's not that big of a deal. I um, Or like here's a plan moving forward there's an option we have things we can do i think it's just really empowering and helpful so i really highly recommend most people get a physical therapist or get a relationship with them um and i will say that very often this might have to look like outside of insurance i know i've said that before um 
most of the better PTs are not in an insurance model because of how much, how little insurance is reimbursed. And it's just not, we're not able to survive with providing the, the care that we need, but also because, um, actually that's like the main reason, uh, because if they are not reimbursing a lot, then we have to see multiple patients at once. And most of the PTs are just not going to going to do that because it's not, it's not quality care in my opinion. So that is why I wanted to bring that story up, right? Because I wanted you to know that one, you know, it's just a good reminder that language is really, really important. Um, we can't just tell people, first of all, whoever this person was looking at my great uncle when he was trying to get into the Marines had no idea what he was talking about. Like, you cannot tell somebody by feeling with your hands that they have a bad back. I don't care if you feel that one side is higher than the other. There, it, th- That is complete bullshit, right? Like we've talked about this before. It doesn't matter if your hip is rotated. If something is higher, this is bullshit information and it, it just needs to stop. We can't tell things with our hands. So that's number one. You can tell when I get fired up about something because I start to cuss a little bit. Um, the second thing is you can directly go to your physical therapist. You don't need a doctor's referral. And um, I think it's really important for us to kind of make that transition into not looking at primary care physicians as this gatekeeper and to understand that you can and should be an advocate for your own health. And that's kind of why this podcast exists to help you learn some things that can maybe help you learn how to advocate for yourself a little bit more. Um, but that's why I wanted to bring that story up. So the too long, didn't listen, which you obviously did because you're making it all the way to the end of this, is just that one, if you feel like cars aren't doing anything, they do. They really are adding up over the course of a decade or two or three. Um, And just because you don't feel substantial differences right now doesn't mean you're not making progress. Remember, it takes a lot of work to maintain, which is really annoying, right? But maintenance is a little bit easier than making progress, right? So we still need to work to maintain our mobility and our tissue health, but we need extra work to make progress. So if you feel like you're frustrated, excuse me, if you feel like you're frustrated, maybe remember that um, you're still doing something, right? Like you don't have to see progress to know that you're doing something. So I really just wanted to like bring that up and just just think about yourself. Literally like take two seconds, visualize yourself like 10, 15, maybe 20 years from now, what are you doing for that individual to make sure that they can move well? Like I look a lot at different people I work with and they even talk to me like some of my older clients and they're just like, I really wish I would have learned about this earlier because I can't imagine how much better I would be. And right now my ultimate goal is just not sliding backwards. So sometimes I think we get really caught up in our frustrations and um, I hope this kind of gets you out of it, gets you a little more motivated, get your cars in um, and just as a good reminder at all of the things that you are doing where you just might not feel like you're making progress. And also I just wanted to remind you too of the importance of load management and just making sure that we're not jumping into things. And um, Ryan's dad got to be the great, um, not guinea pig, but great example for that. And we can all thank him for that. Um, He has no idea probably that he's being talked about on this podcast, but it was too, um, I think it was just too relative to not talk about. So thanks to him and my great uncle for being great examples. And honestly, I just hope you got something out of this and thank you for listening per usual. I do have a fun little podcast coming up to talk a little bit about my reflections since I turned 30. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my past decade in fitness, which is pretty cool to think about and things that have changed in that. So if that is interesting to you, we'll be talking about that, I believe in the next podcast, if not the one after that. So stay tuned. And if you heard anything that really just like resonated with you, let me know if you have not left a review yet for the podcast and you feel inclined to do so, it's super helpful. So go do that. Um, if you already have, thank you so much. And last but not least, if you know uh, somebody who would benefit from hearing some of this information, please pass it along. This is, I want to get this information out. This is stuff that I just wish more people had access to. So send it along. And with that being said, we'll catch you on the next podcast.